We shall dive into Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. <clears throat> I repeat, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Salvation is not by man, but by God. Let me read this, these verses. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. And that's the text. Here we have sort of reached, uh, Paul has reached a climax in his letter. This is a very central text for the book of Ephesians. As I think I, may, I, I did mention in my first uh, the first time we looked at Ephesians, to summarize the book of Ephesians, I said that uh, basically the central text of this letter that summarizes the whole letter is in verse 10. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we may walk in them. The first section of Ephesians deals with how we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. The second part of Ephesians, which begins in chapter 4, talks then about how these good works that God has prepared beforehand, the church, we are to walk in them. So... Let's keep in mind that this is a very climactic and a central text now that we are looking at of this letter. And we will look at the context, we will look at the whole thing also. We are, that is God's work created to good works. Firstly, man is nothing. But God is and does everything in salvation. Man does nothing in his salvation or her salvation. And God does and is everything in salvation. It is all by his grace, his kindness, his snellhet. As we heard last time, looked at last time, God's kindness. First, we look at in this text, we see that salvation is not by man. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It starts by saying the word for which connects this to what he has said before. It is because of God's kindness, God's grace, that you have been saved and not of yourselves. Not of yourselves. Here he talks about them, the Ephesians, the church at Ephesus, the, those Particular persons, Christians who are, have been saved by God's grace, they used to be by nature children of wrath. Before in this passage, he said this, by nature you were children of wrath, just like the others. But now... God has saved you. They have been saved not of themselves. Salvation, the word salvation or the 
the the concept of being saved presupposes that someone is in danger someone is in some need and has to be saved or rescued or salvaged by someone else salvation presupposes that you cannot save yourself someone else has to save you you are in some kind of danger some kind of distress and have to be saved from this danger so they are saved by faith and now faith here the faith is not the the cause or the condition of them saving themselves but it is the instrument that god has decided to use the instrument that god has has uh, decided that the, by faith this salvation is received it's not an act of faith that makes yourself saved you do not save yourself by believing in something or having faith in something instead faith also presupposes that you trust in something else not in yourself that you have faith in something else than yourself that you understand that you do not save yourself salvation being saved presupposes that you are in danger you need someone else to save you and faith also presupposes that you cannot believe in your own strength or trust in your own strength to save yourself but it is a relying having faith confidence in something else in fact he con he continues this is not not by yourselves this salvation by grace by faith none of this is by yourself it's not even their faith the faith that they have is not even by themselves here this word uh, this in some translations the swedish translations doesn't have any doesn't even have that word in it but it says this not by yourselves or detta inte av er själva this word when when you look at different commentaries I, I have looked at different commentaries and they ask the question what what does the word this refer to does it refer to grace does it refer to salvation does it refer to faith when paul says this not or of yourselves is it is it about this grace that is not of yourselves is it this faith that is not of yourselves or is it this salvation that is not of yourselves and they have different opinions because the the word here this is in the neutral form that doesn't uh, fit with the other forms of the other words so they say what 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 does this refer to and they go into different reasonings but let's just say that this refers to the whole thing the whole salvation by grace through faith all these three things this is not of yourselves this salvation by grace through faith is not of yourselves and all, all the three things the grace is of course not of yourselves the grace is from god salvation is not of yourselves of course salvation is of god but what about 
faith again? Is it your believing? Is it man's act of faith or man's, man's realization that he has to have faith in something else? Also, or is it is also faith not of yourselves? In fact, even faith is not of yourselves. It is not that you as a man, a person, a human being has the ability to conjure up the faith that you need to, to stop having faith in yourself and start having faith in God. It's not in man's free will to believe. It's not the act of man in his free will to have faith, to believe in God. It doesn't even come from man herself. In fact, as we read in, in verses 1 through 3 here in chapter 2, it says you were dead in your trespasses and sins. You followed the world. You followed the devil. You were children of disobedience. You followed the flesh. You walked in your sin. Followed the desires of your f flesh. You were subject to the prince of the principalities of the power and authority of the air. That is Satan, the devil. People in this state that are completely dead in the trespasses will not by their free will have faith or have anything to do with God at all. So this faith is actually not of yourselves either. The faith comes from God. Again, verse 9, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. He repeats, he, he repeats this truth. It is not of yourselves. It is not a result of yourselves or your works. That you would have something to boast about, to brag about. Not even this faith is your work. Not even this faith is your act of believing. Something that you have wrought by yourself, in yourself. It is not a result of anything you have done. Someone may even say that I, I did something better than others by believing in God, by having faith in God. Some, that would be a ground of boasting if faith came from yourself. But you do not have anything to boast in. Man has nothing to boast in. These Christians that Paul is writing to had nothing to boast in, to brag in. Not even the fact that they had come to faith, had received the word of truth, the word of the gospel. As Paul said earlier in the letter, they had been sealed by the Holy Spirit, received the word, but that it wasn't by their own doing, their own boasting. It was by the Spirit, the work of the Spirit in them that had done that. So not by your works, not even by your faith. Paul is not either making a distinction between ceremonial works, religious rituals, or moral works, good deeds, acts of compassion to others. He's not making any distinction that is some works, some works that you save yourself by, by doing certain ceremonies or rituals, taking the Lord's Supper maybe, getting baptized maybe, going to confession maybe. No, no, none of those works, or is it maybe by doing good to others, by donating all your money to charity, donating money to poor people you have around yourself, or being a nice person to, to your fellow 
brothers or fellow human beings. No, it's not of any of those works. It's not by your work of faith. It is not by your works of charity or good deeds. It is not by any religious ritual that you are doing. Not by anything that man is doing that would give man a reason to boast in it or brag in it that I did something that made myself saved or made God save me. It is not based on merit. It is not, not nothing you did so that God now has, God is now obliged to reward you by saving you or any of that. No merit, we read in Romans 4 and 4 about Abraham. Now the one who works, his wage is not credited as favor or by grace, but as what is due. Someone who has worked, has merited something, has earned something, and God is, it is God's due to to reward that person, but it, it is not that with salvation. It is not that, that at all. It is not by works. It is not by any merit, not by deserving anything, not by any, anything that you can boast in or brag about or make God guilty or ma make God have to save you, obliged to save you. No, no boasting or bragging. Romans 4, again, verse 2. Here Paul talks about Abraham and also reasons and uh, argues for salvation that it has to be by grace and not by works. And here it talks about Abraham and his faith. And he says, for if... Abraham was justified by works. He has something to boast about, but not before God. So if justification, salvation is by works, by something that man does, anything, man has something to boast about or brag about. But it is not that. Man has nothing to brag about or boast about before God, to make God impressed. God is not impressed by your efforts, by your good works, by your things that you maybe think merit salvation. God is not impressed. Who are you to be boast before God about things that, sure, you should have done holy things but God is the most perfect holy he's not impressed by a sinner who maybe does something that he thinks is good or merit salvation quite the opposite and we don't have anything to boast before men either like the the Pharisees they boasted before men for their good deeds they blew the trumpet when they gave alms when they gave money to the poor or gave temple tax they boasted before men look how holy i am i am such a devout jew i'm such a holy man holy person and they they loved to be greeted by people in the square and to offer up fancy prayers just to be praised by men, to be seen by men. They were boasting in their good works before men. But Paul here says, Paul as, a, as an ex-Pharisee, he, he used to be like that, but now he says, no man has anything to boast in, no works, no boasting before God. And no boasting before men. He says in Philippians, those things that were gain, I now count as loss. I now count them as dung. 
something to flush down the toilet with those explicit expressions. This is Paul. Man is not to have any boasting. Man is not to have any praise. Only God. God alone is to be praised for salvation. Because this is what he says, said just in verse 7, the verse before. God did this, saved them by grace, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. God wants to boast to show his great grace and kindness to us and god is the one to be praised god is the one who boasts righteously rightly so boasts in his power to save even the the most helpless and worst of sinners again this is repeated throughout ephesians from chapter 1 1 verse 6 God elected them before the world began for the praise of the glory of his grace which he freely bestowed us in the beloved and chapter 1 verse 12 he repeats the same thing to the end that we who were the first to hope in Christ would be to the praise of his glory and verse 14 to the praise of his glory he did all this to the praise of his glory no man has the power to boast no man has anything to boast in no works or anything that he saved himself by it is all so that god alone shall have the praise God alone shall have the glory for saving people, for his grace. And then verse, chapter 1, verse 19, it, it shall be shown what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. These are in accordance with the working of the strength of his might. It shall be shown what is the surpassing greatness of his power. How great is his grace. With what, what great power was needed to save sinners that could not save themselves. How great was that grace that saved wicked, evil, hell-deserving damned sinners forgave them saved them raised them to new life gave them new life no man is to boast in anything but god alone in salvation salvation is not by man but by god We can repeat these arguments. Why is salvation not by man? The argument Paul does in the context here that we have looked at, that we always need to repeat and summarize these. These are arguments against man. Arguments that salvation is not by man. And they are also arguments against mm -hmm man paul has talked here in chapter 2 from the beginning that man is dead in sin man is born dead in sin because of adam the historical adam that was a real historical person that brought mankind into sin and death and brought death into the world and sin and brought it all over mankind, those who were his descendants, all of us. 
man is not half dead. This is arguments that why men salvation is not by man because man is dead. Man is not half dead. She's not a walking corpse or some kind of zombie that can make her way to the place where she can get saved. She's completely dead. She is dead. As dead can be, not half past dead or half dead. Completely, 100% dead. As she lives in her sin, she is dead in God's eyes. Spiritually dead to God. She is dead and unable, totally unable to move herself to salvation. She being a slave unto sin, enslaved to sin, living in sin, loving sin. She is then unable to do anything good before God, to do anything spiritually good toward God, or even to want to have anything good from God. Even the will to be saved from this state is not in her. That's how dead she is. That's how unable she is. If you can't do anything or if you do not want to do something, you can't, of course, do it. But God did something and changed man's will. Then she is under a a judicial dead, a legal death under the sentence of death, not only to die physically, but die eternally, not ceasing to exist, but dying the second death that is described as being thrown into the lake of fire to be tormented forever and ever. That's the death that man in her deadness is awaiting by her, her own guilt, by her inherited guilt from Adam and also by her own guilt that she has incurred through her sinful life. She deserves nothing but damnation, condemnation, eternity in hell under God's wrath. No comfort, no pleasure, no leisure, no good things from God, but only wrath and justice and judgment. Why, why then can't she, why is this an argument that she cannot save herself? Because she is a criminal. She has committed crimes against God. She has broken God's holy law. And therefore, justice demands punishment. Justice demands punishment for crime. If you are a criminal, it doesn't help you that you abide by the law other times, but then you commit a, a crime here and there. And you say, but, but I, I didn't commit the crime another time. So that's merits my salvation or if you walk walk against the, the red man or let's say you, dr you drive against the red light the police takes you and he says now you have to pay you have, justice has to be served now because you have broken the law and you have to pay the penalty it doesn't help you to say that but it was just this time i always I always wait for green and then drive. And those times, because I do that most of the time, that should merit my salvation. I, sh I do not have to pay this ticket now because, because of the other times I followed the law. Imagine you stand before a judge and you're found guilty, but the jury or whatever justice system we have. You're found guilty 
you're standing there and you're, you sp the only thing you say to your defense is that sure I'm guilty but but I'm al not always guilty of doing that I do good things also I help women across the street I washed my neighbor's car I do good things also so you do not have to punish me because I'm good overall that doesn't work same thing the same thing it is before God you're a sinner you have sinned before God and even if you only committed one sin that would be enough to condemn you forever because one sin is against the eternal God and one sin is eternally bad and one sin is deserves eternal payment eternal punishment but you have not only sinned once or twice you have lived an entire life an entire lifestyle of sin that's how hopeless man is she is deserving on of eternities of eternities of a thousands of crimes of deaths of punishments that she cannot ever pay she cannot ever be able to pay that's how completely helpless man is then that's why salvation cannot possibly by any means be by man she's dead in sin she's unable to save herself and she is guilty and has to be punished so in this helpless state man is and then comes the words but God verse 4 but God and here we see how salvation is not by men it cannot be by men but say salvation is by God verse 10 not by works that any man may boast for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand so we would walk in them so by grace through faith you are saved and that of God not of yourselves it is the gift of God not by works not that any man may boast for we are his workmanship we're not our own workmanship we are God's workmanship here he talks about them about regeneration the new birth the new creation that we are in Christ that God has made us into God has made us into new creations creatures we are his workmanship in Christ we are new creatures in Christ it doesn't happen outside of Christ it doesn't happen to random people even though they do not know anything about Christ or do not believe in Christ it happens in Christ because he's the one who paid that penalty that we deserved more on that later We are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand. And here again, it is not simply that God has created these good works and prepared them beforehand. And then teaching us that these are the good works that we have to do. It is not that we, we are created for good works in that sense that God has just told us what are the good works and then we have to go and do the good works by ourselves. 
It doesn't talk about the, the teaching of the law, that God gave the law to mankind and that was an act of grace that made it possible for people in their deadness to keep the law. No. It talks about these new creatures that we are, are created so that we will do these good works that he has prepared beforehand. He has preordained beforehand these good works. He has predestined, he has beforehand prepared, decided that we should walk in these works, not by a general providence, but by a sovereign act of regeneration, by creating us unto to these good works. He hasn't just created us, turned us on, and then we are to go and do the things by ourselves. No, he has created us to these good works. He has given us a new will, a new desire, a new disposition to do these good works. That we are to walk according to them, to live in them. Again, he used the words, the word walk here. You are to walk in them, in these good works. As he said before, you used to walk in sin. You used to walk according to your desires, your flesh, the principalities of the power of the air. Now you are to walk in these good works that God has created in you. Again, he, it's not just by his assistance that he helps us to do it, but he creates us to do them. He doesn't just leave us then to do the right thing or to choose the right thing, make the right choice to do the right thing. No, he creates in us this will and this thing so that we actually do it also. It is completely certain that his creation, his new creatures, his regenerated ones will do that which he has created them for. Okay, we're not saved by these good works. Often when we maybe talk to Catholics and we quote Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we forget to include verse 10. And then Catholics may be quick to say, but, but verse 10 said, says that we should do good works. So let's remember to have this verse with us also and show that it's these works that Paul mentions here are not works that we are being saved through. We are saved to do these good works. And that these works, that we are God's works, workmanship. These works are not even our own works. They are God's. They are a result of his work of his deed, of his workmanship. We read, for example, in Philippians 2, verse 12. So then, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. This might sound like works-based salvation, but then... You continue to verse 13 and then you understand. For it is God who is at work in you. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This good work doesn't come from you. This good will, your desire to do the good thing doesn't come from you. It comes from God. 
It comes from God. God is working in you. Both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So it is by grace, by the gift of God. Again, I have defined grace. I will repeat that again. Grace is not only to forgive sin or to to let someone go of their punishment, to pardon them, but also to give them something extra. It is the gift of God. Giving not, not only to avoid hell, but also give them heaven. Not only to avoid death, but also live a new life here on earth. Grace is not just to get out of this world, to get out of hell and then get into heaven. Grace is also for this life, this new life on earth for Christians. Being a new creation, being given faith, being able to repent, to walk in sanctification. All this is ultimately a gift from God. And it is a gift by grace because God is not, again, God is not obliged to give anyone anything. Rather the opposite, he's obliged by his just nature to punish us. Because we have sinned. He's not obliged to then save us or give us anything. But instead he has given us salvation. Salvation is not a reward for anything we are doing. It is by grace. By God's unmerited favor. Again, by grace through faith. Even faith is grace. Even faith is a gift of grace. It's not that God in his graciousness has chosen to view faith as something that merits salvation. Are you with me? It is not that God looks at good works that we can do and then by his grace chooses to say that, okay, if they have faith, then I will give them more grace. By my grace, I will view faith as something that deserves salvation. No, it is not that. Even faith is A gift of grace. It is the gift that receives the rest of the gift. Maybe I can I can give a little illustration. Maybe it's bad, or maybe you know illustrations are never perfect. But maybe you you look at uh, who wants to be a millionaire or uh, or lottery stuff or competitions on TV, and then. They go to the the winner who won the competition here. The person has won a car and usually they they come with a small present to the person and the person opens up the presents and it is car keys. The keys are a gift that receive the rest of the gift, the car. Then they they when they see the car keys in the package They understand immediately and of course they say some blasphemies usually on TV and then they can go out and get their car. They can unlock their car and drive away. It is the the gift that receives the rest of the gift. They haven't merited anything of themselves. Now, I'm not very fond of, of illustrations like that, but... Sort of faith is the gift that receives the rest of the gift. And it's all a gift by God's grace. Proofs 
from the rest of the Bible, John 6, 65. No one can come to me unless it has been granted him from the Father. Faith is a gift. Coming to Christ in faith is granted by the Father. It is a gift. Second Peter 1 and 1. To those who have received faith of the same kind as ours. By the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. They have received the gift of faith. And Philippians 1.29 for to you it has been granted for Christ's sake, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer for his sake. So Paul here presupposes that to believe in him has been granted them for Christ's sake. Being enlightened in your mind to understand your sin, to understand that you cannot trust yourself, trust your own works, cannot do anything, but completely has to throw yourself upon the mercy, rely completely on Christ and not on yourself. That insight comes by the grace of God, by the Spirit working on you. So we see that salvation from beginning to end is completely by God and his grace. As we read the, the golden chain of redemption, the whole chain of salvation is preordained, including sanctification, including the good works, is preordained by God. Romans 8, 29, 30. For those whom he foreknew, election, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son, that is sanctification, to become conformed to the image of his son, that was preordained, so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. It is he who did it. He, he, he does all these things from beginning to end. That is God. God foreknew. God predestined. God, God, God. He did all these things. And they are certain because he has preordained them. So election, as Paul says in the chapter 1 of Ephesians here, election, God has elected you. God has preordained you before the world began, not of yourselves, before you were even born, before you had done good or bad, because it all depends on God's grace, God's decision. He elected you in Christ. He chose you in Christ. He chose you to be redeemed by his blood, by Christ's blood. Redemption was preordained by God. Redemption. And then Christ there redeemed his elect, the elect, the Christians. Completely. Merited by Christ's work on the cross. There he did that work of redemption where he died for the sins of his people. Where he took their punishment upon himself. Completely paid the penalty. Took all that wrath that would take eternities of eternities of thousands of hells for all the individuals of his elected people. He paid them all on that moment on the cross in his perfect, holy human body, in his divine, eternally valuable person. 
he took all the punishment and could take all that punishment upon himself gave that salvation saved us from sin from judgment from hell and saved us to new life bought new life for us redeemed us that new life with god and its blessings salvation there was completely finished and deserved merited by christ alone and then this work of redemption is being applied on the elect when the spirit works in them when they are called by the word of the gospel this word of the gospel the word of truth they are being called they're being born again they receive the new birth they also receive repentance and faith as gifts by the spirit they receive the gift of justification by the faith that they have received they are adopted taken up as his children to become a new creation a new creature his workmanship completely from beginning from eternity past to the end to the final sanctification to the final perseverance to the end and then finally to the glorification from beginning to end salvation is a hundred percent by the grace of god and not of yourselves it is the gift of god and you are god's workmanship know this now that you are to walk in these works that he has prepared beforehand christ is perfecting his church making them perfect as we read in hebrews 13 and 20 now the god of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant even jesus our lord you have no right to accuse god or to demand what god almighty has to do you're not the judge of god god is your judge but in the other sense you're right you cannot believe in, in god you cannot have that saving faith in your flesh that saving faith which is not simply believing that god exists but that well-founded reliance and trust in christ that you cannot save yourself or merit your salvation or anything like that in your atheistic mind you are egoistic and believe that god is has to reward you you believe that you're a good person and all those things but you're not you need to receive this gift of faith to understand and see that you have sinned against God. And this is not about atheists, of course. So many religions, in fact, all other religions other than true Christianity, biblical Christianity says, man, I has I have to save myself or I will save myself or i can save myself just have to do all these good deeds that so that my bad deeds are out of way i just have to atone for my own sins i just have to do these rituals no my dear friend you cannot save yourself you cannot make yourself into making good deeds instead of these good deeds that you desire are the result of salvation and not the cause 
understand that when you repent and trust in Christ, you will become a new create creature and you will then be be a holy person that you're striving to be by your own works. You will be sanctified and walk in sanctification. Faith in Christ is necessary. This faith that you have to be given by God that is the assurance and understanding that the work of Christ is the only way to salvation. It's not possible by any religion or any good works or anything that man can do. So there are no rituals, no, not, you're not saved by being a church member, you're not saved by going to church or to the mosque or to your religious gathering or non-religious gathering. You're not saved by being baptized, you're not saved by going to confirmation, being confirmed. You're not saved by charity, works of charity. You're not saved by taking the Lord's Supper. You're not saved by following the Ten Commandments. You're not saved by following the Sermon of the Mount. And you're certainly not saved by following things that aren't written in the Bible. Salvation is by grace, through faith. Christ alone, by God alone, it is the gift of God. Now trust and rely on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Lord, we come before you humble, understanding that there is nothing in ourselves that we can do to save ourselves. Indeed, we who are truly Christians have known this for a long time, but Lord, we always need to be reminded of this truth so that we do not start boasting or bragging or become proud of ourselves. <coughs> Lord, we thank you that you, in your grace, saved us. There was nothing that we did. There was nothing we could do. And you were under no obligation to do anything. You would be just in just letting us all pass on into eternity in the lake of fire. But instead, by your grace, by your unmerited favor, you choose. And you saved us and gave us eternal life made us new creatures, made us your workmanship to walk in those good works that you have prepared beforehand, before the world began. Lord, we can only thank you. We cannot do anything else. We can only thank you and praise you. We cannot repay it or do anything. Only thank you. Lord, for those who do not believe, God, we pray that you will give them the gift of faith. We cannot force them, we cannot persuade them in their flesh. You have to give them that gift of faith and salvation. We pray this for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.